it's actually that one is for freedom of expression, you're for democracy, you're for freedom, and you're against state censorship and penalization of potentially offensive speech. Does the hate speech bill threaten freedom of expression? I pose this question to Daniela Ellebeck and Michael Swain of For South Africa in a recent episode of my podcast. What follows is a short extract from our longer conversation. You can watch the full episode by clicking on the link in the description below. Enjoy. Right, so Daniela, let's uh, turn to you. We're recording on the 14th of September, and I'd like to pick up on this issue of the hate speech bill. The comment period for public consultation, that's now closed, but the bill is still before Parliament. Uh, what are some of the risks that you've identified with the bill, and what efforts are 4SA doing to raise awareness around some of these potential problems? I think the starting point is perhaps to consider that we haven't been a democracy for that long. We've been a democracy for less than 30 years in this country. And we come out of an era of apartheid where speech and expression were heavily censored and people were sent to jail by the state for undesirable speech. And I mean, there are numerous cases of people really fighting for this right. Um, and it was only in 1993 with our interim constitution that it actually became entrenched in a bill of rights. And people could rely on, okay, I am allowed to say stuff and the state can't send me to jail for it if the state doesn't like it. Now, less than 30 years later, we seem to be back at the very same situation we found ourselves in before democracy with a bill that wants to criminalize speech. And for the first offense of hate speech, you will go to jail for three years. For a second offense of hate speech, you will go to jail for five years. Now, perhaps to explain freedom of expression. The right to freedom of expression extends to offensive beliefs, opinions, politically incorrect thoughts and opinions that you want to express publicly. And the constitution only limits that protection on three grounds. One, the propaganda for war. Propaganda for war is not protected speech in this country, so the state can pass laws to limit it. The incitement of imminent violence and imminent violence there being the key concept because um, in the case of Moyo, the Concord said that, you know, the Intimidation Act was too wide because it only actually required what would come down to incitement of violence. It didn't have to be imminent. So it actually unjustifiably limited free expression that was protected by the Constitution. Because, for example, the court said there that if you were to go around and affluent suburb and start handing out flyers advocating for expropriation of our compensation, um, that, for example, would be limited under the Intimidation Act, but it's something that our constitution sees as protected. And then the third ground for speech that isn't protected is the advocacy of hatred based on race, ethnicity, gender, or religion with the incitement to cause harm. Now, this is commonly known as hate speech. And what this bill seeks to do is to criminalize that. And people might go like, okay, but what's the problem with that? So I think the first problem with that is that in this country, we already have the um, Promotion of Equality and Prevention of Unfair Discrimination Act, known as Peputo the Equality Act, and that's a civil law. So we already have a remedy for hate speech that has seen quite a few hate speech cases where people were fined, they were um, ordered to apologize, and so forth. Um, quite a few cases, such as Bongani Masuku and um, John Melani, were decided under the Equality Act. And recently, last year, in the Quilani case, the Concord looked at the hate speech definition in the Equality Act, which at that point, as Michael often points out, had been in effect for 21 years, and said, hang on, this definition is way too wide. This definition actually limits constitutionally protected speech. We need to narrow this definition down. And the court significantly narrowed that definition down. And But what this bill does is it takes that Equality Act definition for hate speech, expands it, and then criminalizes it. So once again, we're back into this position where we're going to criminalize speech that the Constitution sees protected. And not only that, this results in a very topsy-turvy situation in law where you've got a lower standard you need to meet in criminal law than in civil law. It's going to be harder for someone to prove that someone should apologize to them under the Equality Act than it is going to be for the state to prove that they should go to jail. 
And as a result of that, we may very well see um, a situation where offensive ideologies, beliefs, thoughts or views are stifled in public. And I mean, as someone who has a regular podcast show, I would be worried about that and how that would affect me because how often what comes out of one's mouth is, is even offensive to yourself. And you're like, whoa, maybe I should backtrack on that. And for example, I mean, this bill, whereas under the computer, you have to prove deep and emotional psychological harm in order to meet the first element of hate speech. Under this bill, any emotional, psychological, physical, social, cultural, or economic harm goes. So what's any emotional harm? That would include offensive. Um, what is cultural and social harm? I mean, as a lawyer, I can't tell you what that means. That's a very vague term. Does that mean for uh, private associations that they now need to accept everyone and say they accept everyone? What, what is the repercussions of this? What is what is cultural harm? So it's a very, very problematic bill in a democracy where we've only recently acquired the right to freedom of expression. And it's very problematic because you're going to go to jail easier than be ordered to apologize. And Michael, do you have anything to add there? I think that one of the biggest challenges of, of criminalizing speech is that just the fact that it's criminalized is a chilling effect on freedom of speech because and particularly as Daniela said the, the definitions of hate speech under this particular bill are very loose in the juice they're very undefined and you don't want a situation whereby people are just inhibited from perhaps expressing their viewpoints look the other thing I think to say is this that I think the motivation for this, at least certainly what's been stated in public, is that it's coming against racism, against racist speech. But we have already seen, I believe, how effectively the uh, common law crime of crimin and urea has been used to basically address those who have used racist speech, Penny Mombo, Vicky Sparrow, being two pretty high profile examples. And so I think the question is, why do we even need this new law on the statute books. Uh, we, we certainly believe that it shouldn't be there. And what we've been fighting for particularly is to have a very robust clause which protects bona fide religious freedom speech. The one that's in there at the moment, which was the source of uh, awareness campaign that we ran, was because the Deputy Minister, John Jeffrey said that he felt that it would cover perhaps something that a pastor would say from the pulpit, but if you, as an individual, express that in some other context, say you put it up on your social media, uh, then it wouldn't protect you. And that's very concerning. And you know, we, we've put forward amendments, as we do, substantive uh, amendments. We put a 43-page submission in. We uh, argued it before Parliament. Uh, 103,000 uh, individual submissions were made to uh, Parliament in the last round of public um, comment through the DRSA a public participation online platform. And when it came back to Parliament last week, it was uncovered that, lo and behold, they hadn't even considered them. And there were certainly no changes made. And so therefore, yes, you know, we, we are concerned about this. We're concerned about the process of it. And we're concerned, in fact, about the need for it at all. Yeah, and the IRR submissions as well were also disregarded. So do you think that, is that going to go back and some of those uh, submissions taken into account or were they full steam ahead? Yes. No, no, that, that was what was decided. And again, um, members of the committee pointed that out and the agreement of the committee was that the Department of Justice now has to go back, review their uh, analysis of the submissions that were made. They said that there was some breakdown of communication. They acknowledged that. Uh, and they're going to then revert, hopefully, with those submissions properly taken into account. But again, you know, th th this thing, but for, uh, I think, perhaps even for essays observation, you ask what role we play, uh, the fact that we were able to recognize that these submissions had been left out and to point that out. Otherwise, who knows, this could have just simply flowed through and lo and behold, you're then left with a law on the statute books, which once enforced is enforceable. And that is obviously very concerning. And to reverse something once it's passed into law, as I'm sure you're aware, is extremely difficult, time consuming and very, very expensive. Yeah, and I suppose there's a bit of a public relations exercise happening here because in many ways it's very difficult to argue against hate speech. Um, nobody wants to be for hate speech. Um, but I think it's very important to uh, root any limitations on that freedom of expression within the Constitution. So just to tag on what you were saying there, I think the correct 
view of this is actually that one is for freedom of expression, you're for democracy, you're for freedom, and you're against state censorship and penalization of potentially offensive speech. Thanks for watching. I'm keen to hear from you, our audience. What does free speech mean to you? And are you concerned by the infringements on your freedom of expression? Leave your thoughts down in the comments section below. Also, if you enjoyed this analysis, you might want to check out the full interview that's linked over here. You can also explore my other channel for more long form conversations that's linked over here. My name is David Ansara. Until next time, take care.